Hey, right, good morning. Our scripture today is from Psalm 139. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know where I sit down and where I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind me and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You have sent us the Spirit of God to dwell in us and be with us. And God, this morning we declare that we need to meet with you. We need to hear from you. We need to be changed by you. And so God, may you do what only you can do. God, may we submit ourselves to your word. May your spirit change and convict and move us in the direction towards you. And may our lives portray a reality, a truth about who you are and how you relate to us. And this morning, God, we want to do this and give you all the glory and praise. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. And as you're seated, if you are a kid or serve the kids, you guys can be dismissed. And while they are moving, uh, some of you have no idea who I am, and that's perfectly good. So my name is David. I uh, actually attend the first service regularly, uh, but I serve students at Coastal Carolina University uh, through a ministry called BCM, Baptist Collegiate Ministries, and uh, have been on this campus for the last 10 years uh, in college ministry for 17 years, part of this church for the last 10 years as well. Um, and I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, we uh, are kicking, ramping back up. Students are moving back in. In fact, freshmen, most freshmen moved in yesterday, upperclassmen moving back in this weekend. Coastal is going to have around 11,000 students um, this fall. And so I would just ask you to pray, join us in praying. There's other folks in this church who invest their lives in college students. And so we believe that students at Coastal um, need to hear about Jesus and be changed by Jesus. And so that's why we're there. Why I'm here this morning is Pastor Ronnie and Morgan are uh, traveling. They are on their way back from Alabama. Uh, and so they picked the easiest psalm they could give me and said, here you go, tee it up for you. So uh, if you've been journeying with us at all, you know that we've been in the Psalms the last five years. And um, luckily I had Psalm 23 as well. So uh, I get all the good ones, I guess. But uh, I am excited to be here. We're going to open the word together uh, and, and talk through this. Now, when we come to the Psalms, if you are first time guests with us, uh, please come back next week. Let me just say that because the preaching will be much better. Uh, but we've been journeying through the Psalms and uh, the Psalms are amazing in a, in a variety of, for a variety of reasons. One is that they express emotion uh, and they express 
uh, thoughts and feelings that don't necessarily just get written out like a letter would, right? And so when we come to the Bible and try to figure out how do we understand the Bible, when we come to the New Testament, a lot of the New Testament, specifically in Paul's letters, it's like, hey, I'm just going to write you an essay and the points are right there for you to see. When we come to Psalms, it's more like figuring out, m- mixing a third grade poetry with like a guy that's super in love trying to court his wife, putting it together uh, and trying to figure out, okay, what is really happening here? And what's happening in the Psalms, there's so many different types types of psalms. We have royal psalms, which declare the glory of God. And we have prophetic psalms, which speak about specifically about the coming of Jesus. We have psalms of lament, which talk about uh, emotional, uh, just expressions of God, w- what is going on in my life, trying to make sense and kind of almost confession that way. And today's psalm is, is different in that uh, it is very familiar for most of you in this room. And yet I think sometimes it's so familiar that we can just kind of skip over it. Uh, If I were going to take Psalm 139 and really preach every verse, it would be probably six to eight weeks of just digging in. There's no way for us to do that tonight. So what I want to do, or this is what I want to do is really unpack what David is trying to tell us. And what I think David is trying to do is uh, similar to this. If you've ever been in those moments where you meet someone famous and you get tongue-tied in the sense of awe. You're like a uh, fanboy, fangirl, right? You're like, I, I don't know what to say. Or, or maybe not even a person. Maybe you've been in the presence um, of something amazing, right? So I do a lot of traveling, blessed to travel. Uh, and over the last year, I've been a couple places and went to the Grand Canyon. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? Like you stand in the Grand Canyon, you don't like make much of yourself. In those moments, you feel pretty small and, and you're just staring at the awe of the God who created the Grand Canyon. Um, I was in Rome a couple weeks ago uh, and standing looking at the Colosseum and thinking, how did these people build this uh, without cranes and everything else? Like, it's just amazing. Like, standing there thinking, like, this is amazing. Here's what happens in Psalm 139. David sees God, knows God, and is expressing who God is the best way he knows how, and he's amazed at who God is. What is so often the case, though, as we get through this, the the title of the sermon is Knowing the All-Knowing Knowable King, is this, is that we can know God... And we can't just know about God. We can actually know God. In fact, in the Old Testament, we talk about knowing. Many times the Hebrew language uses the word know. It actually means experience. It's a sense of knowing by living through it. And what I want you to understand is when David's writing these words, and he's going to mention the word know several times, we've already heard it read, is this, is that he's saying, like, I know this to be true. Like, I know acknowledge it's true mentally, but I have experienced this to be true as well. Some of you in this room maybe are on the acknowledge, but you haven't actually experienced some of the goodness of God. Uh, and as we unpack this, what I want you to do. Um, so as we go through the psalm, here's, here's gonna, how it's going to happen, is I'm going to specifically um, talk about three specific terms that actually aren't in the scripture, but what David is describing. And those three terms will tell us about who God is. And then from there, I think David points us in two specific directions for our lives and what that means. So we have to understand three things about who God is that then dictate two things the way in which we live. So um, as we go this morning, understand that that's, that's what's happening. So first of all, here's what I want you to know. First point is this, our God is omniscient. Our God is omniscient. We have a God who is all-knowing. We, we see this primarily through the first six verses we're about to read. We also see it play out. And these things kind of overlap as we go through the scripture. But this is what it says. It's a psalm of praise to the choir master. Verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So this word omniscient simply means all-knowing. What David's describing is a God who knows him personally. He starts off in verse 1 with this declaration, God, you have known me. You have searched me. And it actually starts as a past 
tense verb, which means that he has experienced this. He's looking back and seeing in his life moments where it's clear that God knows him based on how he's interacted with him. And this word search that you see, um, the, the Hebrew there is this word to dig deep. It's as if you're digging deep for minerals, right? It's not like God knows the, the clothes I'm wearing and things like that. He knows deep into my soul, into my heart. He knows me. He's dug deep into me. And then you can see how David transitions from like, you have searched me and known me to kind of some present tense verbs where he says this idea that God is active in our lives. There's a continuation present tense when, and somebody knows you today. I don't know who you came in here with this morning, but uh, chances are if you did come in here with somebody, they know you pretty well. Uh, my wife was in the first service and uh, she knows me too well. Like she knows me scary well, right? Like so there's things um, like we'll be together and something, somebody will say something and she immediately like don't say anything. Like because she knows what's in my, right? Anybody there, right? Like or like maybe the elbow comes out a little bit or stuff like that. Like she knows me better than I know myself, right? There's moments where like I'm just in a fog and I, I don't recognize I'm in a fog and she's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? She's like, no, no, no. Like you're not okay. What's going on? Like she knows me. For many of us, just to be real, there's times in our life where this is scary, where somebody knows you that well. In fact, depending on how you grew up or maybe the relationships you had at home with family members, with dad, mom, like you don't want to be known that well. So you put up guards and things. And, and, and what we see, what I see a lot of times, even with college students, is that there's so many roadblocks to relationships because people are afraid of being known. Because they sense this thing, if somebody knows everything about me, there's no way they'll like me. If somebody knows what I think, there's no way they'll put me in that position. Friends, if you knew what was in my mind, you would not let me stay in it. Like, the reality is all of our thoughts are open bare before God, and yet he still loves us. Everything. He knows every thought, every heart motive, everything we do, everything. He knows it better than my wife knows me. God knows me. And yet he still says, you are my beloved child. He says the same thing to you. And so what we see here is is that David's expressing this, this this idea that that you are known. I got to play a game the other night called Chameleon. I don't know if anybody played Chameleon. Nobody had played the first. So this game called Chameleon, it's a brilliant game. And the whole idea of Chameleon is, is that if you are the chameleon, you have to kind of fit in to the group so, so you're not exposed as being a fraud, all right? That's the best way I can put it. And so everybody gets cards, handed out a card face down, and all the cards, except for one, have a kind of a grid that tells you what number you're looking at, like kind of what answer you're looking at. There's a board in the center, a little card in the center, and it might say fictional characters. And there's 16 fictional characters in a grid, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. And the roll dice and it corresponds, but the person at the chameleon has no idea what they're supposed to be looking at. All their card says is you are the chameleon. Whereas everybody else says, oh, it's A4, A4 is Spider-Man. I'm supposed to give a word that correlates to Spider-Man. And so I'm, I'm dealt the chameleon card, right? And I'm like, I gotta pay attention. I gotta figure this out. Cause everyone's trying to figure out who the chameleon is. So the first person guesses and they say, amazing. And I'm like, oh, what's amazing? Oh, Spider-Man's amazing, amazing Spider-Man. Next person goes, sticky. Webs are sticky, right? Next person goes, right? It goes around and it comes to me and I'm, someone's, the person in front of me says, red. I'm like, it is definitely Spider-Man. I say, suit. Close enough that they think that I actually know what I'm talking about, right? But doesn't give away that it's actually Spider-Man, right? Next person goes around. And then they have to figure out who is the chameleon. And the whole idea is you don't want to get caught. You want to say the right things, be the right facial expressions, be in the room, be around the action, but not get caught. And at the end of the day, you can play chameleon with your friends. You can play chameleon in church. You can play chameleon at work, but you can't play chameleon with God. He knows if you're a fraud. He knows, right? And here's what I think ultimately for us, many of us is we, we get comfortable playing the game of like, this is what it's supposed to be to be a Christian, or this is what, it's spo- this is what I'm supposed to do. And so that I heard this over here, so I'm going to borrow this, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And what ends up happening is we know a lot about Christianity, but we don't know the Christ of Christianity. 
And so what happens is, is David is saying, no, 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 like it's scary if you don't know God that he knows you. But if you know that he knows you and you know him, it is the most comforting thing you could ever have. That he knows everything because it means he loves you in spite of everything. And so what we see here is he's saying this, that he knows all of us. He, he knows us. Look at verse 2. He knows our movements. He knows when we sit and when we rise. Everything we move, every direction we go, he knows our movements. He knows our thoughts. I mean, you just like start to catalog your thoughts from like the past three days, past 24 hours. Like, have all of your thoughts been holy and wholesome and good? Mine haven't, but guess what? God knows them and he loves me still the same. He doesn't want to leave me there, but he doesn't reject me even though he knows all those things. Sometimes I think we can fool God. We can't fool him. Verse 3, he said he knows our actions. He knows our ways. He, he knows all of them. Everything about us, God knows. Verse 4 talks about how he knows our thoughts as well. The God who created this world, he holds it all together. He knows everything about us, and yet he still loves us. And what David says is that this is unbelievable that God has all of this knowledge. And you think about David's life, and we're going to get to that a little later, like the fact that he knows everything that David's ever done. And yet David knows that he is perfectly loved in God. You get to verse 5, and it's this beautiful language that sometimes we don't really, at first it seems kind of out of place because, let me just read, it says this, You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. This, this word him is actually a lot of times used in the Old Testament uh, when people are surrounded. So when the people of God are surrounded by enemies, they're hemmed in. But what David is doing is beautifully pointing a picture of the fact that we're not surrounded by enemies, we're surrounded by God. This is hedge of protection by which we are actually knowing that he knows us and that we're protected by that. And what's amazing about this is oftentimes when we think about a protective barrier, we think maybe God's trying to trap us or God's trying to keep us from things. Uh, I follow a, the greatest football team uh, that's going to start playing in a couple weeks. They've won a couple national championships in my lifetime, most recently two. And um, they, they play in Athens, Georgia, University of Georgia. Any dogs? Yeah, okay, go, go dogs. So here's the, thing, here's the video about the stadium in Athens. They're called, actually, in fact, if you might know this, they're called they play between the hedges. Now, the hedges protect the field. In fact, they go around and they're beautiful, but it's a hedge of protection to protect the field from everything else. Now, here's what you need to understand about the hedge of protection. Do you think the football players playing and enjoying life on the football field feel trapped by the hedges? No, 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 no. In fact, anything, it gives them a boundary by which to enjoy life in. It's the same way with God. When you realize that God has a hedge of protection before you and behind you and to the right and to the left, you don't feel trapped. You know that God's got you. And it says that even this, is not only is him you in for, his hand is on you. So in the midst of having protection, his hand is on you. And what David is saying is this. In the midst of being all-knowing, he says this. God has you such a place and he knows everything about you that nothing surprises him. There is no life event. There is no life circumstance. There is nothing that can happen to you that God doesn't know about. Further, there is nothing that can happen in your life that God does not allow. Scary, right? Like, create some real questions of, well, bad things happen in our life, and we feel the consequences and effects of sin, so how do we deal with it? Here's, here's the deal. God is holy and protective, but he is sovereign and in control. He knows all things. He doesn't learn anything. He knows everything. In fact, David says, before a single one of my days, you know them well. It's this idea that if we live in this life and we sin, we deal with the consequences of our own sin. But sometimes we don't sin, and other people's sin has consequences in our life. And in the midst of that, if it happens to us, we can be confident knowing that God has a purpose because he has him to sin before and he has him to sin behind and his hand is on us. And what David is saying is in the midst of whatever happens, you can know that the omniscient God is not surprised. He is all knowing. It's this confidence, this encouragement. It's this simply saying, I know that God knows. 
And what David then declares in verse 6 is this, if you stop and just think about that, like just stop, we, we could go no more verses. If you stop and think about it, David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Like his mind is blown already to think about. In his life, everything that's happened to him, he knows God knows. Everything. And yet still wants a relationship with him, still pursues him, still offers him love. Our God is omniscient. It's not something that you decide if he is or isn't. He is omniscient. You respond and believe it and experience it. Just don't know about it, but actually experience it. And if you experience his omniscience, it should give you confidence. If you don't experience it, it should give you concern, right? Because God is a God of judgment and righteousness, and he knows all things. Nothing is hidden from him. David continues on, and the second thing we're going to talk about this morning is that, is that our God is omnipresent. Our God is omnipresent. That he is everywhere. That he's not in everything. He is not everything, but he is everywhere in everything. He pursues us. We see, we see this in verses 7 through 12. That It's not just that God is there, but that he, he's there because he's pursuing us. He's there because he wants a relationship with us. And, and so this is what he says in verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Correlating to David's knowledge of God's knowledge, he knows that God is everywhere, that it, that it kind of relates to each other. That not only is he all-knowing, but that he's everywhere. And while this might be hypothetical Im- imagery language that David is using, what he's basically saying is this, is that he is saying no matter what happens, no matter where he goes, no matter what is in his heart for fleeing or not fleeing, he knows that he can't escape God. And that's a good thing. He's saying, God, I, I can't run away from you. Like, I, I cannot escape you because I know you will find me. You know where I'm at and you will find me. My daughter, my daughters are six and eight. I have an eight-year-old, six-year-old. My six-year-old loves to play hide and seek. She like absolutely loves it. Uh, we play it sometimes during the day with the whole house being available. And sometimes, uh, and most nights, she wants to play it at night when it's bedtime, which means her whole, only her room is available. Right. And so um, the, the house is a little more challenging, except for like I'm fully aware that like in the house I can find them, although they found a couple good spaces. Uh, but in the bedroom, it's super easy. Right. Like there's like three places that she can go. Uh, and so I check one, two or three and boom, there she is. She starts crying. It's fantastic. It's great daddy daughter time. <laughs> and so what, what I've started doing is just laying it like going laying in the bed and being like, I don't know where you are, right? And then like, I'll hear a voice like, all right, you're in the closet, come out. Like, like she just like reveals herself. Cause I, but like for her, it's this greatest thing. Like she thinks she can escape detection. When my wife goes in after me, uh, her instructions are she has to hide first. And then Amanda comes in and lays on the bed. And then she like won't come out. For her, it's like, mommy, are you asleep? Well, kid, if I'm awake, you're not coming out, right? Like, if I say I'm asleep, I'm lying. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And so, like, then I hear tears from the next room as I'm laying with Adley at that point, right? So it's just this great bonding time we have as a family. Here's the point. My daughter thinks she can hide from her dad. In a confined space, 90-square-foot room, she thinks she can actually hide from me. Silly, and yet we think we can hide from God. Why do I think? Because we do. We commit sin, and instead of running to God, we run away. Things go crazy, and instead of pursuing the only thing that can satisfy us, we go to the world. It's played out over and over again in Scripture. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, we have the very same picture, right? Adam and Eve enjoying company. One command God gives them, do not do this. Everything else you can enjoy. They take of the fruit, and in one instance, their life is changed. Whereas they would have fellowship with God, God hasn't changed, but they would have fellowship, be completely nor, like normal relationship with each other. They were naked and unafraid. They take a bite and they suddenly feel shame and guilt and blame. 
And it says in Scripture that they heard the sound of the Lord God coming and they went and hid in the garden. Think about how silly that is, right? I mean, here's God showing up on the scene and it's not like he's showing up on the Amazon jungle. It's a garden probably less than the size of my daughter's bedroom. And he calls out, Adam, where are you? He says, well, I heard your sound and I was afraid. Well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten? Right? It was a sense of God knew, one, that he had eaten, and God, too, knew why he was hiding. And yet Adam hid because he didn't understand that God knows and sees and is everywhere. Friends, we, we can't hide from God. He pursues us. And what David's understanding here is it doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter what I do, both physically or in this uh, emotional realm. God, you know me. And so you pursue me and you're there. L- listen, this is what he says. He says, where can I go? Where, where can I flee? It's a sense of nowhere. Like there's nowhere where your presence is not because you've created all this. If I go t- to the heaven, it's just simply saying like if I ascend, if I just go up on a trip to the heaven, guess what? You're there. But if I also decide to lay down and spend considerable amount of time in Sheol, guess what? You're there as well. Like there's no place, doesn't matter how short or how long of a time I'm there, God, you are consistently present in my life. You're there. What about darkness? Can darkness come to me? If I turn off all the lights, maybe you can't see me. Maybe I can just hide in darkness. And it says, no, 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 like darkness is light to God. Light, he shines. In fact, 1 John says, in God there is no darkness. He sees everything. I cannot escape because you are everywhere. Darkness and distance do not affect your relationship, God. It cannot separate your presence because he pursues us. Look at verse 10. He says, in fact, your hand in the midst of all that your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, immediately we have two kind of conflicting thoughts. If for those who don't know this God or don't know this quality of God, it might seem restrictive, right? Like, how come God won't leave me alone? Or, or it might seem like restrictive, like I can't do what I want if God's there watching me, right? Or it's the sense of it. But for those who really know God and know his heart and love for you, it's this sense of a spouse putting comforting hand on the shoulder and saying, I'm with you. A lot of times we look at God like a police officer. Don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. And if you do this, I'm going to come arrest you when we should be looking at God as a comforter because he sends us the Holy Spirit to comfort us at all times and everywhere we go. And this is what David's understanding. He's picturing this thing and saying, God, your presence is protection. Your your protection and your presence give freedom. Give me confidence. Give me hope knowing that you are with me. It's not an adversary relationship. It's his protection and provision. And so the question for us is how do we live knowing, experiencing this, that God is with us, that he's present with us, that, that he made the promise to Moses, Moses, I will be with you. And though Moses died, he continued the promise with Joshua, Joshua, I will be with you. He prayed the promise to David, David, I will be with you. He makes the promise through the prophecies that God will be with us, Emmanuel. Then Jesus comes on the scene, God with us. God actually demonstrates that he is with us, here with us, lives a life that we cannot live, dies a death that we deserve, and does what only he can accomplish by rising. And he shows that he wants to be with us and then sends us the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance because he is in us. This is what David is portraying, this beautiful picture, this omnipresence giving us comfort. For some it may cause anxiety, but he is with us. You are never alone no matter what your circumstance you're going through. No matter what pain this life brings, no matter what news you may get, no matter what your kids do or don't do, no matter who you may lose in this life, no matter what happens, God is always there. He is your ever-present help in time of need. He is with you. That's what David's singing and praising about. And, And then third, he gets to this, that our God is omnipotent. Our God is omnipotent, which means that he is all powerful, that he is the creator. We see this primarily in verses 13 through 16, though there's some overlap and there's whole sermons written on this. But what I basically want to say is that by this, I mean, he has complete and total control over everything. And when David zooms out in this moment to zoom in on his life, what he's basically saying is even over the smallest details of how I came to be, God is in control. Listen to what he says, verse 13, for you formed me 
in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God, your works are wonderful. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet was none of them. The beauty of birth is unbelievable. You see babies and you're like, beautiful babies. And the reality is, is that how, how does a baby come from such a humble beginning, unless God himself do it, does it. And what David's recognizing is that everything that makes him him was created by God. It's this beautiful picture that we have life and life can exist, not only spiritually, but in this world physically, because God allows it and provides for it and is powerfully doing it. It's God. That's what David's saying is that God creates, God forms, God does all these things, that God is the creator, that he has all power. I was driving to breakfast with my daughters this week, eight and six. Remember that when we get in this conversation, right? And so we're driving and we're, the sun's coming up and my daughter says, Dad, how come the sun always looks like it's in the same place? It always looks close, but it doesn't burn us up. I was like, well, it's quite far away. That's why. Well, if it's so far away, why does it look like it's so close? So we started having this really intense physical physics conversation and all this space science, all this stuff. And we get into this idea and I said, well, we're if any closer to the sun that we would burn. We we couldn't exist. And I said, do you know where the only place where life exists? And Dahlia says, my six-year-old, earth. And it says, well, they found water on Mars. I'm like, Adley, calm down, relax. Like, what do we get into right here, right? So we have this conversation. I'm like, anybody help, want to help me? I just want pancake and eggs at this point, right? And so we're driving, and I'm trying to explain to them that in the midst of this amazing creation, then we get into them. And I said, do you realize how amazing it is that God created you? The, the way your molecules bind together, the way your bones are structured, everything happens perfectly because God has intricately created you. Now let's start our worship song, right? Like that was like, let's get, let's, let's understand that you exist because God has created you. And we kind of talk through this idea that the crown jewel of creation, though there's beautiful mountains and beautiful oceans and beautiful things to look at that God has created and set in place to draw people's attention to himself. He created hum, humans, mankind that he formed them, and that they exist to draw attention to himself. Even just watching the Olympics the last couple of weeks, you watch people like do stuff, and you're like, I could never do that. Like, I, I, could, I, I mean, I couldn't do that, right? Like, there's so many things, you know, except for the breakdancing thing, I could probably do that part. But, like, there's other things that, like, you just, like, you're like, how does that, how does your body move? Like, how does somebody jump that high? I'm like, I don't have that ability. But what we understand is, is that we're all made creatively different, and God made you how you are for a reason. It's beautiful to watch that even in that, even as you're watching athletes do what athletes were created to do, you see that they've worked hard and they practice. It's not just like they came out of the womb and jumping over things. It'd be kind of weird, right? But the idea is that they are utilizing what God has created them to do. What about you? God created you. He formed you. He puts you where you are for a reason. Are you praising him through your body? Think about it this way. You guys realize you got, you got hands like other parts of creation don't have hands. Like we can grab, and grapple and, and rip and pull and push and all kinds of things with our hands that trees don't have hands. They got limbs, but they don't do the same thing. Like we have feet that, that move us in certain directions, right? And that, that we can jump and we can run and we can squat and we can do all kinds of things because God has created that specific for our bodies. That, that he has created us as a person to point to himself the glory of his creation. And this is what David's getting at when he's saying, God, you, you have formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And though I don't always feel like that, God, I know this to be true. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written. Every one of them, the days were formed for me. 
Like you as a person, no matter what your background is, no matter what your family structure is or whatever, you were created by God. That he created you, that he knows you. And that though this world may discard you, though people may abandon you, may people may say you're not good enough, God says you are mine. And David is declaring this and re, uh, pointing our attention to the omnipotence of God, which aligns with his omnipresence and omniscience. You say, well, what does this David know about that? Let's talk about that for a second. What does this David know about God's omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence? Okay, let's talk about it. David, the shepherd boy, was born into a family with, with multiple siblings. This David was overlooked numerous times. In fact, this David was discarded because of the way he looked, because his size, because he wasn't big enough, he was young, he was born in the wrong order, all of these things. This David was given task of going to get cheese, like, go get your cheese while we go fight, right? This David would also come back and saw that God's glory was being challenged by a giant named Goliath. And this David actually said, hey, I'm in. And they all made fun of him saying, you're too small. This ain't going to work, right? This David said, no, no, no. Like, I'm willing to fight for the glory of God. And in the midst of that, we see that, that God uses him to point to Jesus, the real David that is to come. But, but this David also becomes king but not at first, he's overlooked again because he's not the right look and he's not the right man. Yet God says, I look on the inward like you are the one I picked. And this David lives and, and he rules and there's actual good things that happen in his life. And then he chooses in his own sin to pursue wrong decision making, right? He decides on his own that, that, you know what, I want that. And so that is a woman who belongs to another man that's in married and they have he has somebody go and bring her to the castle, right? And this David commits adultery, lies about it, and then kills somebody as a result of it. This David cries out in the Psalms, early in the Psalms, God, I am a wretched man. Create me a clean heart, O God, because I am twisted on the inside. He, he confesses his sin after he's been confronted. This David then has to deal with the consequences of that decision through his own offspring, who cause headache, talk about not a perfect family. You guys understand, if anyone's well-equipped to talk about this, it's this David. And this David says, it's not about my past failures or decisions or even the good things I've done. It's all about the goodness of God. And he's sitting there to the choir master. God knows everything. David, he knows everything, every thought you've ever had, even that one about, yes, he knows all of them. God, he knows all of my moves. He knows that I had Uriah killed. He, he knows that I had all this thing. God, David, does he, is he with you in all things? He, in all of my depths of sorrow, he was there. And in all of my victories, he has been there. What about David? Powerful. He's created me. Here David is like declaring these things, saying we need to praise this God. I've experienced it, so should you. And as I get older, I, I think so many times that I have to come to terms with this God and me as well because I used to make fun of people. I'm just being real for a second. I used to make fun of people who had midlife crisis. I was like, oh, what is that about, right? As a Christian, I'm like, wow. Now I'm like, dude, I get it, right? Like, I don't play sports like I used to. I'm just getting older. I feel old when I get like, I'm just, I, I get it. I, I, I get it. And as I reflect, I ask these questions more and more. Is my life counting for the Lord? Does anybody see what I'm doing? Like, do I make a difference? Like, I have to come to terms with these questions. And start, am I living as a good dad in the home? Am I raising my kids in the right? Like, I don't want to wake up 10 years and be like, what did I do to them? Right? Like, it's this sense of, like, I'm asking these questions and craving. And God, David is pointing me to the God who is omniscient, who knows all of those thoughts, thoughts concerns, and emotions. David is pulling me out of my, my mindset and saying, Get, focus on the God who is with you now, who has you before and back, and his hand is on you, and he's guiding you, he's with you in these decisions in these moments. And David's also saying, you know what? You can't do it, but God can. The God who created you has the power to work through you because the Spirit of God lives in you. Like, this is, this is what David is doing. He's saying God knows you. He knows your hurts. He knows your fears. He knows your anxieties. He knows your thoughts and your motives and your dreams and your frustrations. He knows your past, your present, your future. This God knows it all. And he loves you and pursues you. Listen to what he says in verse 17. David's experiencing, he says this, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. 
How vast is the sum of them? If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. What David's saying is like, if you ever question these truths about God, just take a little short ride down to the beach, start looking at the sand and start trying to count. And David said, I've tried to figure out how much God loves me and I've given up. It's too wonderful because he loves me more than this sand ever could ever be. We live at a beach. Do it regularly, friends. Like go and realize that you are small and yet significant because God loves you. And David feels this. And he's, he's experiencing, he's writing this praise song to let us know. And when we know God this way, when we experience this God and his lordship, it should reflect on two things. And there's two things in the psalm that I want to draw our attention to as we kind of move towards application. And one is this. He actually says it. it's the only time he actually says he's going to do something as a result of this. And what we see is that he says, I will praise you. He says, for I am wonderfully made. I'm intricately made. I will praise you. So number one is this. We praise the king. If you know that he's omniscient, all-knowing, if you know that he is everywhere you are, if, he, if you know that he is all-powerful to do the things you cannot do and you want to do and that he created you, you praise him. Like that is the natural response. He created me. He pursued me. He loves me. He knows me. So my thoughts, my actions, my movements should draw attention to the God. Like we understand what praise looks like when we come into a space like this. But so many times in life, we leave it here. Friends, when you wake up tomorrow, your thoughts, your actions, your movements should praise God, should draw attention to him. What I mean by that is this. Do you find comfort that he knows all things? Walk in confidence that you are comforted. And it also says in scripture that if you are comforted, it is to comfort others. So maybe you offer that to other people who don't know that God knows all things. Or, or, or maybe God is everywhere. This idea that there is a hope because he is never going to leave you nor forsake you, that he is with you always. So we walk in our jobs and the things we do and the sports we play and whatever we do, the, the relationships we have that we offer that God will never leave you alone. And so maybe you offer comfort and presence to somebody else who doesn't know that God is with them. Or maybe it's this idea of omnipotence, right? That, that all of our actions, that we stop trying to accomplish great things for God and let God do great things in us and through us. That God's power works mightily through us. And Jesus actually says in the New Testament, greater things will happen through us because the spirit of God is in us working through us. And so when it says this idea of praise, it's this idea that glorifying God in our body is not about not necessarily what we won't do. It's about this, that we direct our body at the king and say, use us however you want to. And may my limbs, may my heart, may my emotion, may my mind all praise you. Because I want people to know you and the greatness of you. We, we see this even played out in verses 19 through 24, but in the opposite way. Those, those kind of weird verses at the end, which, which talk about my enemies and this idea of how they hate God. And it's just, just the thing, what he's basically saying is wrong thinking tragically leads to wrong decisions. If you think the wrong things about God, it's impossible for you to know the right God. Tozer says, whatever you think about God is the most important thing about you. And so we have to know the right God, which is what David's pointing out, so that we don't become the people in these verses. But it's not only that. It says David's saying, look, like, I want your holiness to be known among all people. And so what David then says is the last thing I have for us today is this, is that we should surrender to him. That our lives should be surrendered to him. Verse 23 and 24, it says this. It's a prayer. Search me, O God, and know me. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's this idea of surrender that our lives posture is to say, God, you are all of these things and I am not. And so I am desperate for you to guide me and lead me in this way. I am desperate for you to examine my heart, even though I've also declared in verse one that you have searched me and know me. Right now, God, search me. Continue to work in my life. Know me and get rid of things that are not of you. Get rid of things in my heart that do not draw people's attention to you so that I can walk with you and lead you in the way everlasting. And what he's saying is this idea of trust. It's just, do we trust God? Do we trust his word? 
Do we trust what he says? Do we, do we follow it as Jesus says this, and also correlates to the enemies in the previous verses. Jesus says this, I have come that they may have life and life everlasting. Right before that says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. May you stop looking at people who don't follow God as enemies in the sense of they're against you and start thinking that they have been captivated by a thief who has come to steal, kill, and destroy their lives. And they need to know the omniscience, the omnipresence, and the omnipotence of our great God. And it's the surrender to that that he's saying, our God is holy. David says, you have searched me deeply. You know me. So God, I want to be about what you're about. And at the heart of this psalm, it's the response of truth to God that, that we deserve judgment. The reality is just taking David's life, but even taking my life or your life. If God knows our hearts, he knows that we are sinful people apart from Jesus. But through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the promise of the resurrection, through the accomplishment of justification, we too can have relationship with God. And so we get to walk in the way everlasting because God has allowed it to happen and he has enough power to bring it to be. And so the choir director gathers everyone and says, sing with me the greatness of our God. Let's pray together. God, we declare that you are good, that you are lovely, you are all-knowing, you're everywhere, you're all-powerful, you've created each of us, and God, may our lives show these truths. God, may our lives portray a life of praise, both in lip service, but also in the way we act. But also, God, may we have a posture of surrender that we recognize that this is not our life. It is yours to be lived for you. And God, so we, we, we declare what Paul says in Galatians 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And God, may we declare to the world around us not that they're bad people, but God, but there is an all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful God who desires relationship with them and that he is there with us. We give you glory and praise in the name of Jesus.